So um, we're trying to, to get data on as many species as we can because there's so many. So here's some of the places we've measured. This is the LA Zoo. LA Zoo is locked at night, so it's a good place to leave data loggers. And these are the daily rates of transpiration. So each bar is a day, a day's worth of water use. And there's different species. You see jacaranda here, high rates of transpiration. This is Pinus canariensis. It's lower, a native species of sumac. And this is just to give you a sense of the sites. Oh, this is a great site, the LA Police Academy. I don't know if you've been in there. It's open to the public. So if you're ever driving by the Police Academy, you should go in because there's a fabulous garden back there, the huge garden with waterfalls and a beautiful forest. It's a beautiful place, actually, the Police Academy. Um, and so we've measured a bunch of trees there. Here's elm, Canary Island pine, and there's um, sequoia back there, the redwoods, rather. So um, the LA County Arboretum in Arcadia, that's a beautiful place, huge botanic garden. Great place to visit if you want to go there. Um, it's where Fantasy Island was filmed. See the house. Uh, a lot of different species we've measured there. So the moral of the story is this. We put all these species and, together and we compared them in terms of water use. This is the daily tree level water use in August of all, a bunch of different species. Big variability. That's, that's basically the message, a lot of variability. And it's, it's an order of magnitude difference, actually, in water use depending on species. A couple of natives here. This is a native sumac, unirrigated, uses very little water. That's not too surprising. This is Platanus racemosa is our native California sycamore. Very popular tree to plant right now. Our campus loves this tree. They're planting it like crazy because it's native. And we have very few native trees here in Irvine. This was not a forest before there was a city. This was a shrubland. But there were some trees that grew along the rivers. We call those riparian trees. And sycamore is one of those. So this is the native environment of Sycamore. This is the Star Ranch Sanctuary Audubon Society run in South Orange County. Sycamore uses a lot of water because of its ecology. Ecologists already know this. Sycamore has to have its roots in the river to grow. That's called an obligate phreatophyte. There's no river, you don't get a sycamore in the natural ecosystem. So it needs a huge amount of irrigation. There are some non-native trees though that I think are very good choices actually to plant from a water perspective. Canary Island pine is from Mediterranean Europe. It grows naturally in an ecosystem that gets just a little bit more rain than we do naturally. Very dry ecosystem. You can grow this without irrigation after it gets established. This was growing at the LA Zoo with no irrigation. Used very little water. Here, this guy down here. Unirrigated Canary Island pine. Doing just fine. Big trees. So. If you put all this together, we can simulate the transpiration, the water use of urban forests. It's, it's also a function of tree density. You know, it's how many trees you plant in an area, a small area. But if you, we can group these into categories. Obviously, unirrigated trees, they hardly use any water. But all of the rest of these are irrigated. So even with very abundant water, some species just do not use very much. It's genetic. It's just the genetic adaptation of those trees. And that includes eucalyptus, by the way. Eucalyptus is not as big of a water user as everyone has been saying. Um, and up here at the high end, again, we get 10 times more, an order of magnitude more water use if you pick a high water use species. So to put this all together, there's a lot of advice out there about what you should do to save water in your yard. So there are a bunch of options here. So ecologists like to talk about this option. Option one, plant natives. Right, you hear that a lot. Now, there are a lot of advantages to planting natives, don't get me wrong. The biggest advantage from an ecological perspective is it's restoring habitat that's been lost. So there are advantages to preserving native species. But the disadvantages is that you're not gonna get all the ecosystem services that you want if you just plant natives. For example, there are very few native trees. So if you really wanna restore the native ecosystem, you would plant shrubs in your yard. Now, I would like some trees in my yard, and I don't necessarily want to only choose sycamore, so um, this is kind of a limiting approach. Option two is to plant other kinds of species that don't use a lot of water, so maybe species from the other Mediterranean regions of the world. There are five Mediterranean ecosystems in the world. Europe, European species like lavender and rosemary, they come from 
from a climate that's very dry. There's dry places in South Africa like ours. There's dry places in Australia, Australia like ours. Um, and so that way you can choose species that you know can tolerate drought, but the disadvantages is also that that's kind of restrictive in terms of other ecosystem services. Also, there's been studies showing that when people xeriscape, even if they plant cactus, sometimes they water just as much as before. They don't necessarily turn down the water. So I think the best option is this one. A scientific approach based on our knowledge of ecology that optimizes ecosystem services and disservices, okay? What we want to do is maximize the trade-off. There are some species that use a lot of water that give us really important things that we need, like food, for example. I actually think that growing local food in your yard is a very good idea, but it's going to use water. If you're going to use the water, why not get something out of it? Problem is we don't have data for, for many species. So ecologists are now starting to accumulate the scientific information that we need to, to do this, to make this more scientifically based. So I would say to conserve water, we need both, we need two things here. We, we do need to consider changes in technology. I do think that those irrigation systems that are based on soil moisture sensors or something similar are very, very good. And we should change to those, but that's not gonna be enough because there are some species that just use a lot of water and need a lot of water. So we need to consider both technological changes and probably changes to our species mix of what we actually plant.